Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Pani Drapanova. And we are back today with our series of conversations and interviews with intellectuals in Ukraine for those out there who are keen to learn more, think deeper, and hear from the original sources. This is already episode 25. І ми повертаємося із нашою серією розмов та інтерв'ю з інтелектуалами в Україні для тих, хто хоче дізнатися більше, думати глибше та чути із перших джерел. В етері 25-й випуск. This is a project of PEN Ukraine, whose entire team is in Ukraine right now, continuing their work under the extremely difficult conditions of terror and the violence of Russia's continuing war against Ukraine. There are no words enough to express our admiration for their dedication and commitment. Це проєкт «Пан Україна», вся команда, якого перебуває в Україні, продовжуючи свою розмову, над, роботу в надзвичайно складних умовах терору та насильства війни Росії проти України. Бракує слів, або висловити наше захоплення вашою відданістю та наповеховістю. The project is co-hosted by PAN International, which has continued to provide a platform for freedom of expression for those currently under the highest risk. The project is implemented with the support of the U.S. Embassy in Ukraine, and our mm-hmm. traditional partners are Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute, the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, and today also Pan Canada. We are streaming today's event to all partners' Facebook pages. Співорганізатором проєкту є міжнародний Pan, який продовжує надавати платформу для свободи вираження поглядів тим, хто перебуває у групі найвищого ризику. Проєкт втілюється за підтримки посольства США в Україні. Нашими традиційними партнерами є Пан Америка, Український інститут, Український інститут Лондона, Україна Світ, Український науково-дослідний інститут Гарвардського університету та інститут Гаррімана при Колумбійському університеті. А сьогодні також Пан Канада. Ми транслюємо сьогоднішню подію на всі партнерські сторінки у Фейсбук. Захід відбуватиметься англійською мовою. And I will switch to English to introduce our guests. Mikhail Rebchuk is Ukrainian public intellectual, journalist, political analyst, literary critic, translator, and writer. Stop me here. <laughs> Professor Rebchuk is known for his analytical articles and essays on Ukrainian politics, national identity, and analysis of Ukrainian history from a post-colonial perspective. We win or we are wiped off the map says one of the most prominent experts on Ukrainian culture and public life about the current war. Understanding this point is crucial nowadays when some countries keep asking, why can't you guys just surrender and stay alive? And Professor Repchuk will talk today to Dr. Serhii Yakelchuk, Canadian historian and expert in the USSR and national relationship. And uh, Dr. Yakelchuk is cross-appointed between the departments of Germanic and Slavic studies and history, and teaches a variety of courses on Stalinism, Russian history, modern Ukraine, and Cold War cinema, given that. Uh, research interests include the social and political history of the Stalin period, as well as the formation of a modern Ukrainian nation from the mi- mid-90s century to the present. And his Ukraine birth of a modern nation published in 2007, was the first Western history of Ukraine to include the coverage of the Orange Revolution. And I believe the last book, The Conflict in Ukraine, What Everyone Needs to Know, was published in 2015, and probably today we should know more. We have a quite challenging task today to be compelled, to try to comprehend the current stage of the war, its causes, and possible consequences for Ukrainian society and the Ukrainian state as well as for the international community and world, order, and world order. So I would ask you to focus on your specializations on, I mean, history of Ukraine after World War II, the influence of the Soviet legacy, the development of Ukrainian-Russian relations and formation of Ukrainian identity and proximity to different contexts. We are lucky enough today here to have a North American one from Mr. Sergei, an European one from Mr. Mikola. So let's try to talk about what mystics and perhaps illusions of both Ukrainians in the world made this work possible. And why have we denied this possibility somehow? What Ukrainians and the international community needs to know and understand today about Russia and Ukraine. 
and I'm going to take a good cup of tea, pencil and paper and enjoy your conversation, taking some notes and counting for insights. The floor is yours, dear gentlemen. Many thanks to Olga for this wonderful and generous introduction. It is a pleasure to be joining a distinguished lineup of speakers. Um, and now we are in the 25th episode. And um, as you realize, um, I'm physically in Canada on an island of the Pacific coast of Canada, and perhaps the farthest removed from, uh, from Europe and the war in Ukraine. But it doesn't, of course, mean that we in Canada do not follow the developments in Ukraine. In, in fact, it is entirely possible that the Canadian perspective on the events in Ukraine is in many ways uh, more interesting and more supportive than the perspective of some European players. Nevertheless, we begin our session today with me being, as I said, on the Pacific Ocean and Mikola being in Western Europe. Mikola, it is a pleasure talking to you again. Um, what do you think is important news of the recent days that uh, force us to rethink the developments in Ukraine and in Russia? Do you see any important uh, developments in the war? Any perspective that was not open to us previously and is now becoming an important interpretive tool? Well, no, first of all, uh, my uh, minor remark regarding our meeting, I uh, haven't seen uh, you, Serhi, for probably for a year or two years, and uh, it's really a pity that we have to meet each other under such circumstances. Uh, yes, I'm in Paris now. Uh, actually, I am here since uh, September because I came for a one-year-long uh, research fellowship and war uh, caught me uh, here. So I'm uh, involved now in very hectic uh, journalistic activities. So I postponed all my academic research and uh, uh, every day I have to, to write some op-eds and uh, give interviews and, and comments and, and lectures and so on. And of course, travel uh, increasingly more. Uh, so uh, yes, I have to, to explain a lot of uh, complicated things to primarily to Western audience. Uh, I encounter very deep, uh, misunderstanding in many cases, uh, but at the same time I uh, observe uh, very strong interest and uh, kind of empathy, so it's uh, situation in this regard is uh, different from uh, 2014 when there also was big interest but there were more confusion, at that time situation was less clear uh, because something, uh, well, first of all knowledge about Ukraine was much more, more, more limited and secondly, the developments in Ukraine were very confusing because there were some, you know, some uh, protests, uh, kind of revolution, which was uh, framed uh, by Moscow propaganda as coup d'etat, and uh, some, you know, far right groups came uh, to power. So it was really um, very confusing. And um, so uh, public opinion was not so uh, unanimously pro-Ukrainian, so supportive. For now. now it's obvious, you know, everybody understands that. Um, Ukraine is a victim, Ukraine was attacked uh, and uh, this, you know, um, war is unprovoked because Ukraine threatened nobody. Uh, so it's, it's clear. The only differences uh, are, I, I believe, uh, how to proceed. People, uh, not only people, actually, you know, politicians also are um, uh, very, very um, have different opinion about this because uh, on, on one hand, everybody understands that uh, Russia is a huge country and very powerful state with nuclear arms so it's um, very questionable whether it can be defeated or to what degree can be defeated uh, on the other hand everybody also not maybe everybody but more and more people understand that this is genocidal war and uh, ukrainians have basically they have no other choice but to to resist to fight and also uh, they um, understand uh, uh, internationally that yes we um, uh, this you know bully Russia as a bully cannot be rewarded because if Ukraine makes any concessions if uh, uh, recognizes some uh, either territorial gains or some you know status gains for for Russia it, it would mean it would encourage other rock states to 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 do similar tricks so you know all the time we, we have to understand to emphasize this um, 
these problems. Uh, for me, uh, probably the most important, the crucial thing, uh, the key uh, element of this war is, of course, the problem of uh, Russian imperial identity, which largely determined all the developments, I believe. So th this is a trigger. A uh, very, very deep uh, source of, of this conflict, but it was inevitable in a way, because if we analyze how historically Russian imperial identity was constructed in, in the 18th century, uh, it from the very beginning excluded Ukraine. It, uh, there was no place, no space for Ukraine in this uh, Russian self-understanding. Ukraine had to be either absorbed, assimilated, or uh, perished, extinguished, actually what we observe today. All other events are, uh, I would say, uh, some minor consequences of this. So we, can, we can speculate about uh, Putin's personality, about the role of uh, KGB legacy, about um, uh, Stalinism and uh, this legacy of Stalinism, which was never was revised and never properly uh, assessed and uh, judged. Um, so there are many, many, of course, many factors, but, but essentially, it's, of course, it's about Russian, Russian imperial identity. And uh, this makes this conflict very irrational and very difficult to understand for Western people who are, as you know, are very rational people and they, uh, they don't understand this uh, zero-sum game. Uh, game. They, they, they believe that, you know, all the people should have dialogue, should negotiate and to find some, you know, uh, solution which is more or less acceptable for both sides. They, they don't understand this, you know, irrational um, desire to, uh, to solve, uh, to, find, to find final solution of the Ukraine question. So this is what I, what I have to, to emphasize is, you know, uh, peculiarities. And sometimes it's very difficult to understand. It's a struggle. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Mikola. I do find myself actually in my public appearances and op-eds following pretty much the same line. So we do share some fundamental understanding of Russia's undeveloped identity as a modern nation being behind uh, so many uh, historical problems in our part of Europe. And isn't it sad that it really takes uh, war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide to wake up some Western observers and Western uh, statesmen and women to the fact that Ukraine needs support and Russia needs to be condemned. I would like to follow up on uh, the line in uh, Olga's introduction uh, where she said that my most recent book in 2015 was called The Conflict in Ukraine. And of course, this has to do with the language, with the vocabulary we use when discussing the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Russia's unprovoked attack, assault on Ukraine. Um, when this book was first commissioned by Oxford University Press, the title of the press suggested was The Crisis in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And already at that point in 2014, it was pretty clear to me and to others in the profession, as I'm sure to you as well, that the crisis basically is an internal Ukrainian affair. It's sort of a civil war which is unfolding in Ukraine without any outside involvement. So I objected to crisis and back then the term conflict seemed more acceptable. And of course, by the time the second edition of the book came out in 2020, it was called simply Ukraine, what everyone needs to know. And the third edition will also have this nondescript but powerful title. And also the image used on the cover is of course of the Ukrainian soldier standing against the background of Mariupol. Um, none of us could guess back then that Mariupol would become uh, the page of glory and the page of uh, Russian atrocities in this war. But, but uh, in a way, in a way, I was a prognosticator in putting this um, image on the cover. So Mikola, I don't think I have congratulated you with your Shevchenko Prize, which I'm happy to do now belatedly. And of course, your book, which was honored with this highest literary um, and nonfiction award in Ukraine, was called the Lexicon of Ukrainian Nationalist. Um, perhaps a vocabulary, perhaps a dictionary, depending on how uh, you translate it in English. But it does share, I think, um, the same concern about how we 
call things, how we give names to events and historical developments. Uh, what do you think in this book was particularly important for us for the understanding of the current stage in the Russian aggression? Um, well, uh, you know, I have I have many hats, and one of them, of course, is a hat of, of the writer. Uh, so uh, I believe this, you know, collection of essay is belong more to to literature, to but uh, lettres rather than to uh, scholarship. Even though, of course, some uh, some academic ideas are developed there, and uh, the essay uh, actually, which uh, not only the essay but the entire book is uh, yes, it's titled uh, "Nationalist Lexicon," but obviously the title is ironical because it's not it's not kind of the Bible for of nationalists. Uh, it could, um, by the same token, it can be entitled also Cosmop "Cosmopolitan's Lexicon" because it it plays with all this. Um, identities and uh, actually what I try to to uh, suggest by this book that uh, we, we are very different and identities are very situational and fluid and we can at the same time be both cosmopolitans and nationalists it depends on, on various circumstances Ukrainians suddenly became all all nationalists yes uh, within within a few within a few days actually yes uh, even the people who never never uh, were susceptible to any nationalistic uh, feelings and ideas who were very, very remote from all this. Uh, so, uh, yes, we have, uh, we have to, to, uh, to explain, to understand this, to explain this. Uh, and um, uh, the method which I uh, chose in this book is, of course, is, of course it's, uh, it's not academic method. It's uh, not a rational explanation. It's an explanation which is um, pursued by uh, uh, discussion of different situations. I try to, to give live examples of how people behave in different situations and to, uh, to, to put some ironic light on these this, uh, situations. Um, so I, I, I know, I, I'm not sure whether it was very successful or not, but I hope that people, people read this book and um, uh, maybe, maybe some people enjoy it. It's, uh, it's, it doesn't, it plays, uh, I believe it plays probably the same role as your book about Ukraine, but you try to explain this to foreign, read, to foreign readers uh, uh, in in very simple uh, way. Uh, I like this book very much because I can advise it to students, to, to people who know nothing about Ukraine. And um, if I'm not wrong, as I remember, it's uh, accessible uh, free of, of charge. It can be reached uh, uh, in the website, maybe changed, but I believe that the, the first edition was uh, had free, uh, free open access. Uh, so it's, it's really great because, uh, you know, such a book is very, very, very needed. Um, but still, you know, I uh, admire you, first of all, as a, as an academician. I, I love uh, all your books. It's really great research and great, uh, great uh, discoveries. So uh, I, I have different question. I have, uh, I'm, I, I'm curious what, what what can you do uh, right now as a historian? Uh, because uh, all our interest, all our attention is focused on uh, contemporary developments, uh, maybe on, even on the future. What's, what will be next? Uh, what happens to Ukraine? And nobody knows. It really is a very precarious situation. Uh, but still, still as, an, as an academic, as a researcher, you probably still uh, think about some uh, historical topics. So I wonder how, how, do, you, um, how do you project today's situation Upon your past research, obviously one one top possible topic is of course this uh, um, un, uh, unexamined legacy of, of Stalinism of totalitarianism, which uh, today is, is came to the fore, which uh, uh, resurfaced in Russia. And you mentioned this all this uh, terrible cruelties, all these uh, genocidal things uh, uh, performed by by Russian army and supported by population, mm -hmm. which which uh, which obviously stem from this. Uh, Russian and Soviet past. Um, so, uh, if if I may ask you about, about your about your next next professional steps, so to say, and I can disclose my own eventually. Um, yes, Mikola, that's an excellent question, as as your questions always are, and of course, for a historian of the Ukrainian twentieth century, the contemporary developments um, on the Russian occupation are very much. Um, recognizable, they resonate with the deepest structures of Ukrainian historical memory. They resonate with uh, the prosecution of Ukrainian 
intelligence uh, during the Russian occupation of Galicia in 1914 and 1915. Mm -hmm. They resonate with the Austrian executions of Ukrainian peasants in 1918, when the Austrian army occupied the southern part of Ukraine, mass hangings, um, capture, requisitioning of the grain. And of course, they resonate in a powerful way with the Holodomor, with the Stalin, Stalin's uh, state-engineered genocidal famine in Ukraine in 1932-33. The very notion of requisitioning of the grain or the grain being taken by the Russian army, I think, is so immediately recognizable that it sends chills, really. It, it almost a physical reaction to that when, when you hear that this is happening again as it had been happening so many times during the 20th century. So these are the powerful signals which, of course, come unnoticed on the Russian side because the Russian historical memory pretends that nothing of that ever really happened. There was no genocide of Ukrainians. Stalin was basically a great historical figure who is ranked very high in Russian opinion polls, unless, of course, Putin is also among the candidates, in which case Putin beats Stalin and Nicholas III. And as a historian, I would uh, I would give a lot to be a fly on the wall in the room in which Stalin, Nicholas II, and Putin meet in hell. That would be really interesting to observe how they would have sorted out their relationship and who would beat, beat up whom physically. The Tsar was in pretty good shape, by the way, um, when he was executed. Now, um, and of course, you know, for many decades, I would answer the question about my the um, topicality of my research by saying that, you know what, my early work was on the Ukraine files, the Ukrainian patriots in the Russian Empire, who tried to undermine the empire, but in a cautious way because they were so limited by the draconian legislation. And then my subsequent books were on Stalinism. And that's again the same time when people can uh, claim in a very cautious ethnographic way that they are Ukrainian because they wear an embroidered shirt and they dance and sing, but nothing beyond that. So the moment it becomes political, they end up in the gulag or in the killing field. But then, of course, it occurred to me that, you know, I was really talking about the Yanukovych of the past uh, in so many respects. And the people who had difficulty selecting the political dimension of identity because the cultural and political dimensions of identity are different, as I think Mr. Putin is now discovering um, that, you know, cities that are overwhelmingly Russian speaking still produce under occupation mass protests against the Russian occupation. And the Russian failure to take Kharkiv is yet another indication that Ukrainian cities fight back because the notion of Ukraine is that of a democratic political community which can be chosen and is increasingly chosen by people who are not necessarily ethnic Ukrainians. And this is our strength. This is our enormous strength. And of course, my research going forward is going to be on that precisely, on how the Ukrainian identity becomes a democratic choice, a pro-European choice, and how Europe perhaps does not realize that it needs to support it. 100 years ago, in 1917, 18, in 1919, Europe rejected uh, Ukrainian uh, cries for help arguing that it is really important, it was really important to have a united Russia in some form, whichever form, the Russian Empire, the Russian Republic. And so that obsession with Russia, I think we still see in some parts of Europe, perhaps in the part of Europe where you are today, McCall, but, um, but I, think, I think the West is well on its way towards learning the lessons of history. Finally, 100 years too late for Ukraine, perhaps several hundred years too late for Ukraine. So what do you think, Mikola? What is, what, is, what is your new project? How are you going to reflect on the issues um, connected to 
Ukrainian identity in modern time, the Russian uh, war against Ukraine. Well, uh, you mentioned you mentioned this so-called uh, Western obsession with Russia, which uh, which is real phenomenon, but I believe it's uh, secondary uh, because the. Um, uh, primary phenomenon, the, the, the essence, is actually um, uh, imperial knowledge, Russian imperial knowledge, which was produced uh, since the 18th century, uh, disseminated, uh, po powerfully institutionalized, exported, and established in the West as uh, academic knowledge, as objective knowledge, as scientific knowledge, and remained at question until recently. That's the problem. Uh, and, and this is where Western obsession with Russia comes. Of course, not only from here, because there, is also, there are also powerful economic interests and there is very powerful business lobby, which, is, um, uh, which makes money uh, with, with this uh, dubious relations with Russia. But, but uh, without this imperial knowledge, without, without this you know, uh, perception of, of Russia as the only agent uh, in, in that territory, uh, I believe that you know this uh, businessmen would not operate so so easily. They wouldn't have this you know free hand. Um, so uh, what what I'd like to examine first of all at this of course to, to deconstruct this imperial knowledge. It's very high time to uh, to challenge it. Uh, it's nothing new actually because this uh, question began long ago. But until Ukraine's independence, this was very problematic. It was very difficult until the collapse of the Soviet Union, because even the idea that the Russian, Russian Soviet Union is empire was absolutely unacceptable. Uh, very, very few people, uh, you know, uh, Western academic world, very few people could accept this. Uh, if, if you dared to say something like this in the United States or elsewhere or in France, you would, you would be perceived as some you know, crazy nationalist or some maverick. Uh, after the Soviet Union collapsed, this knowledge, be, this you know, information began began be more or less penetrate uh, Western academia. But still, you know, still we have problem with mass mass media, with uh, common wisdom, with uh, popular culture. Uh, it's a bit. Uh, a bit easier with uh, academic uh, publications because yeah they are they are peer reviewed there, is, there, is, there, is, there are more responsibility and, uh, more knowledge actually so it's more or less normalized it's difficult today to find something like you know statements like uh, Kiev and Russia yes instead of Kiev and Rus it's which which was quite normal you know 20 years ago it was absolutely normal to find a lot of books textbooks uh, which uh, use this terminology or something like thousand year old Russia and so on. So um, imperial knowledge is big problem because really it marginalizes all other countries. It's uh, uh, Russian empire or Soviet Union as any empire tries to speak on behalf of uh, subjugated people. Uh, they have no voice, they, ha they are invisible, they are completely marginalized, provincialized, they, they, lo they lose any agency, they, they are nobody. Uh, so, of course, it's difficult to, to come out from the shadow. Uh, what we are doing now, and uh, Ukrainian uh, appearance, belated appearance, of course, is, re is pitiful, it's a big regret, but, as a, uh, but nonetheless, we, we did it, we, I believe we suc successfully did it, and uh, it we paid very high price for this. That's the problem. Uh, so of course we can uh, we can enjoy. We can be happy that finally we emerge on the uh, mental map of uh, Western community. Um, nobody can deny now uh, Ukrainian agency. Nobody can question that whether it's a nation or not. Or yes, it's it's, it's clear. Uh, but it was not so clear even 10 years ago. And I believe that even in the first days of war, it was not so clear. Uh, the, uh, today in Ukraine, I hear a lot of voices which criticize, uh, criticize uh, uh, Western partners. That they did not provide uh, sufficient help. That they did not uh, believe uh, in Ukraine's success. Yes, but unfortunately, Ukrainians gave some you know, reasons to, to, to think so. Uh, Ukrainians had to prove that they are ready, they are able to, to resist. Uh, and only after that, they began uh, to be perceived seriously. Only after that, the Western powers began to invest uh, money and resources and uh, high-tech weapons. Uh, before before uh, Ukrainians began their resistance, it was quite you know, questionable. It was quite problematic because what if we give this you know, high-tech 
uh, weapon uh, from the United States or elsewhere to Ukrainians, and they give up everything and escape or, or, or shift the side and uh, embrace Russians. It was, you know, for, for us, it's more or less clear. We, pre we predicted, you know, some kind of resistance, maybe so not so uh, large scale, not so powerful, but actually, you know, as people attached to Ukraine, we knew the situation much probably better than Westerners, but for, for Western governments, it was very, 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 very ambiguous situation. Uh, so um, yes, we have we have to deconstruct, and I believe this is uh, duty of all academics, not only historians, not only political uh, scholars, but also uh, people from from philology, from literature, from from all from all the humanities. I believe um, in all in all academia, we have to decolonize you know this uh, the knowledge about Russia, about Soviet Union, about um, Eastern Euro Europe, about all this, you know, very complicated, but essentially colonial relations. And we have to explain that this war is, is uh, actually uh, anti-colonial war, it's national liberation war. It was postponed in 1991. We, uh, we attained uh, independence relatively easy because just because the empire collapsed, but, but it was not, um, uh, <laughs> empire was not defeated. That's a problem that it, it was weakened. Uh, and uh, it was uh, it accepted, you know, this, uh, this loss of, of uh, colonies, but uh, but did not reconcile with this loss. That's, that's the problem. And now we have a sort kind of you know uh, second second part of this uh, national liberation struggle, uh, which hopefully is the ultimate and, and final. Uh, but we, we have to do this job belatedly. But basically, we do the same. Actually, the Poles had to do this in 1920 when Bolsheviks uh, uh, tried to enter Poland and they uh, and reached uh, Wisla, Wistula River. So they were stopped only there, and, uh, just you know, 100 kilometers from Warsaw. Uh, more or less like now, the Russians are stopped <laughs> a few kilometers from Kiev. Uh, so uh, yes, we, we we have to explain this, and I believe this explanation is especially important uh, in the so-called global south because we have the biggest problems there. In the West, we have great sympathy and great support, but if you if you take a look at uh, how um, uh, Ukraine developments are covered in the mass media of, of uh, Latin America or uh, Africa, India, uh, it's, it's really very, very, very sad uh, because in most cases uh, the, the war is presented as kind of, of proxy war between uh, United States and, uh, and Russia. Uh, Ukraine, Ukraine have no agency, Ukrainians are just on pawns which are manipulated by Americans uh, who, who want to undermine, who want to weaken uh, Russia. So uh, they absolutely refuse to understand that, you know, Ukrainians carry out anti-colonial war exactly as they themselves carried out 50 or, or 60 or 70 years ago. Uh, because actually the anti-colonial war of Indians also could be presented as a war between, you know, proxy war between <laughs> United Kingdom, for example, yes, and the Soviet Union. It's ridiculous, of course, but it's insulting, I believe. But still, this, these stereotypes are very, very vivid. Why it's there? And they persist. So uh, it's huge, 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 huge job, I believe, to to promote this, you know, uh, understanding, promote knowledge, uh, pr to cover this event from from post-colonial, uh, anti-colonial perspective. Um, that's one of, of challenges, which I recognize as as a as a journalist, as author, author of uh, op ads. Yeah, exactly. And I have been thinking also about that new tools available to us now with the wide recognition the term decolonization received in the West. In particular, it becomes uh, quite a bit easier to explain the developments in Ukraine, both in the 19th and especially the early 20th century and now. And, and I'm sure you have noticed that some figures from that transitional period, the transition from Ukrainophiles to Ukrainians, those who refused to call themselves Ukrainophiles, like Lesya Ukrainka, I think, recently became a much bigger, much better understood figure in the Ukrainian canon than it was previously, because that moment of transitioning from speaking Russian to speaking Ukrainian as a matter of principle, that moment of fully rejecting the empire, not partially, like in the generation of Dragomanov, even so Dragomanov 
uh, was the first one really to introduce the West to the notion of ethnographic Ukraine. He published the first map of ethnic Ukraine, but his goodbye to the empire is incomplete. It really takes a generation of West Ukraine to make it the final break. And then of course, there is immediate parallel with a generation of yours and your friends and your spouse, Mikola. And here I think back to my years as an undergraduate student at the, the Taras Shevchenko University of Kyiv, now the National University, when already then in the late 1980s, uh, I was reading your articles and thinking, wow, this is new. This is new in a way which is dangerous and challenging and exciting. And that was also for me the period when I was switching to Ukrainian. <laughs> and it almost feels like, well, you have influenced me and in a variety of ways. But also when I think of this, I cannot help but think of the previous generations that went through the same transformation, the generation uh, which went as, uh, uh, as Russian speakers living in Ukraine in the 1920s, choosing Ukrainian identity. Um, ethnic Germans becoming Ukrainian poets and prominent ones for that matter. Mm -hmm. A number of Jewish writers selecting what uh, Johann Petrovsky Stern called an anti-imperial choice. So it looks like we are reliving the moment, the moment which once happened already in Ukrainian history, which also for that reason becomes important. So it looks like history keeps repeating itself at some levels. And we should probably derive some serious lessons from it uh, so that we don't end up again having to repeat this cycle the third time, discovering the importance and the democratic potential of Ukrainian identity. But this time, it seems, you and I are in agreement that the West is finally waking up and we have important tools to help the West to wake up by showing to them that what they are doing at home, removing the statues, is very much the same as Ukrainians have done several years earlier, removing the statues. And it's easy to understand why the statues, because of course, Lenin in Ukraine stands not for communism, but for the Russian colonial past, for closeness to Russia. And that I guess was also um, an important moment for me when the policy of decommunization was resought. Because when it was originally announced, of course, the immediate, immediate reaction was, ah, but Putin is not the general secretary of the Communist Party. This is the problem. Putin also rejects Marxism. He also rejects uh, Bolshevism. He only likes Stalin for different reasons, for the nuclear bomb and the great power. So it's way more than about uh, Marxism and communism. It's about a much longer process and also the process which is so much easier to understand in the West. Because once you label a colonizer, a colonizer, everybody knows there is no going back. It's like uh, you are being canceled <laughs> starting immediately. If you are a powerful empire oppressing minorities, oppressing women, oppressing uh, all kinds of groups, that's it. That's a language which is so much more powerful. And I'm sort of hoping that at this cycle of history, when we are embracing Ukrainian identity again as a democratic anti-imperial choice, the West would finally listen to us because we now understand, and this is a major contribution you are making and your generation has made in making the West understand better what Ukraine is about. So do you feel they are opening up to, to our argumentation? Uh, yes, I believe that uh, this um, overwhelming support in the West for Ukraine is largely determined uh, not only by the fact that it's, you know, unprovoked war and in the European continent, but also this is probably the only war of such a scale which is carried out uh, by uh, dictatorship against democracy. Because there are a lot of wars in the, on the globe, and uh, many of them are very obscure because it's not quite clear who fight whom and uh, for what purpose. And basically, uh, in most cases, both sides are quite authoritarian. Uh, in this case, it's, it's 
is obvious. Ukraine is fleshly democracy, maybe immature, but quite quite functional with democratic elected president and parliament and with institutions, with freedom of speech. And we know uh, that Russia is increasingly uh, totalitarian. Today, it's not just the authoritarian, it's totalitarian state with, with mandatory ideology, with uh, very, very tight uh, persecutions uh, and so on. So uh, I believe that, you know, this uh, Western sympathy is also largely determined by, by this, uh, by, by specific values. And this is a third, uh, third topic of my, my research, uh, uh, of my eventual book, if I ever produce it. It's actually, you know, about, um, uh, about um, a very difficult uh, choice which, uh, have, uh, which Western powers, the Western government have to make, Western societies have to make between uh, values and interests, because we all understand we are humans, we have our own interests, we cannot, uh, we know we are not uh, sent uh, people like Jesus Christ, we cannot sacrifice everything, we need some basic uh, clothes and, and food and some uh, minor uh, pleasures, <laughs> like holidays in, in Hawaii or so on. Uh, so, of course, we um, cannot sacrifice everything. Um, uh, and also, we understand that, you know, there are some measures of, of intervention, there are some measures of support, so there are some measures of sacrifice. We understand that, you know, it's one thing to, to bomb uh, Milosevic, to bomb, bomb Yugoslavia in order to rescue uh, Kosovars from genocide, but it's more difficult to bomb um, Russia to, or to rescue either Chechens or Georgians or Ukrainians. Uh, uh, or uh, for the other matter to, to, to rescue Tibetans occupied by China. Uh, so, uh, of course, there, are some, there, sh there should be some fine, there is some trade-off between, between uh, interests and, and values, and we have to discuss this issue, and uh, we have to understand this, but also we have to find some arguments to persuade Western governments and societies that, you know, some sacrifices are necessary, not huge, but, but, but still they are necessary for, for the sake, for, for both strategic reasons and moral, uh, moral reasons. Strategic because uh, it's easy to explain because Russia is a threat, a threat for international stability, for, for international peace. It's a spoiler. It's a very toxic uh, rogue state. Uh, so strategically, it's important to help Ukraine and to to, to defeat Russia, but also morally, of course, it's very important because uh, it's a, a support of uh, victim of aggression, of, uh, and also it's also important to um, to prevent very bad example for other rock states who may follow the, the, the same uh, the same example. Um, so uh, we have to explain this and. Uh, Maybe it's not so um, so big sacrifice if, for example, uh, Western uh, citizens, uh, citizens of Germany or France, uh, would uh, lose like 100 euro a year. Yes, it, they, because of the sanctions of all these problems, uh, economic turmoil, uh, they are likely. Uh, specialists calculate that it would cost uh, like 100 euro per each citizen of European Union, which is quite a sum, but it's not uh, probably it's not a uh, so huge sum. And if you if you compare this uh, loss of this hundred euro and uh, lives of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Ukrainians who are killed uh, by Russians, we have uh, today I read that there are 300 something Ukrainian children already killed, not, not just civilians, but children. Uh, so of course, uh, in this case, probably moral choice would be more uh, more reasonable and more justified. Uh, to, to put it simple, you know, uh, the cost is to uh, decrease uh, your temperature in apartment in winter for one degree, or to increase it for one degree in summer uh, in, in air conditioning. It's, it's a maybe less comfortable, but you know it's not so huge sacrifice if you if you compare the sacrifice with what what is going on in Ukraine. If you take a look at Bucha, at Mariupol, and all these things, so it's just you know it's a matter of communication. I believe that the situation is difficult, and of course I understand that every government has their own um, electorate. They have to to persuade them that uh, Ukraine is important and we have to to support it. Um, uh, but it's a matter of communication. There are very very from my Reviews that are very, very reasonable arguments to, 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 to be addressed. Yeah. And, you know, to add up to that from the Canadian perspective, I have to say that, of course, Canada is unique in the West in that the presence uh, of the Ukrainian Canadian community, which is not the largest numerically, the American one is technically bigger, 
but of course proportionately as, as a portion of the general population is fairly significant and it is a bipartisan issue in Canada, which means that both major political, all three major political parties are fully supportive of Ukraine and the Canadian effort to support Ukraine. And the most uh, kind of the most notable criticism of the government uh, right now from coming from the right is in fact that uh, the Canadian military is not robust. The Canadian army is not really developed. And that is a limitation which I find myself explaining uh, to Ukrainian colleagues quite often. Uh, Canada is a wealthy country compared to Ukraine, but just like other Western countries other than the United States, it doesn't have a strong standing army and it doesn't really have uh, too many artillery pieces to send to Ukraine, really. Uh, Canada sent four uh, mortar guns, four, four, four large guns, but that's pretty much what Canada could send. So the challenge to the West here is that, of course, the West needs to understand that, that, that we live in a new world, uh, the world in which democracy is being challenged uh, decisively and by very harsh means by dictatorial authoritarian regimes. And you're absolutely right, it's not just Russia. There are others waiting in the wings and seeing how this thing will unfold. And that's the lesson for our Western governments because our government is very strongly pro-Ukrainian, includes uh, the second most important position in the government is occupied by uh, a Ukrainian-Canadian woman, uh, Christia Freeland, from the Homyak family of Edmonton. Um, and, 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 and still, it's just the objective limitations on what Canada has, in fact, been investing into its army. So they need to change the entire worldview. The worldview was, but basically, the United States are going to help us if anything happens. And we can always continue spending under 2% of the budget, even so being a member of the NATO means you must be spending at least 2% of your budget on the military, but nobody was doing it, really. And of course, the recent signals from Germany and France about building a more important European army, and then even more recent signals from the UK and the United States about building an alliance with Ukraine and Poland and the Baltic states. They basically indicate that there is no agreement on how this is going to proceed. There's an understanding of the need. We need to be spending more. We need to have stronger armies and we also need to have more tanks somewhere in warehouse in case Ukraine needs them, right? But I don't think it has been decided at this point. And then Ukraine also then plays a really important historical role, world historical role of forcing the, the West to wake up, forcing the West to unite in this form or that form because there is a very real threat. And then of course the Ukrainian tragedy is that we have to go through genocide, we have to go through the Russian invasion in order to show the West that the Cold War is not over. Uh, that, you know, you need to remember the lessons of the past. All of us have listened to the voice of America and Radio Liberty as we were growing up and uh, yeah, studying at the university. And this is going to come back in some form, uh, bypassing the restrictions on the internet. This is going to be a battle for the hearts and minds. And I think uh, people like you, Mikola, have really an important role here because in this new Cold War, it is no longer the question of having um, specialists in the West who know something about Ukraine. It is a new principle, which I like very much. Nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. So it should actually be scholars and public intellectuals and writers from Ukraine whose voice sounds powerfully in the West, uh, who are the people telling the West what is happening in that part of Europe, how to deal with Russia. And I do hope that there is a serious investment coming in Ukrainian studies in major Western countries and in the new channels of broadcasting uh, the news to Russia, into Russia, um, sending the signal to the Russian public, which is now really completely atomized, even more so than in Stalin's time, deprived of uh, institutional structure for oppositional movements, dissent, or even 
this part of information. There are other problems with the Russian public, which would deserve another lecture, of course. But I think there is a role for us to play. Do you agree? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Ukraine, of course, unfortunately, Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukraine pays very high price for this uh, awakening of the West and for refurbishing of Western institutions. Uh, but uh, basically, I'm optimistic about that because we, you, Ukraine forces uh, uh, to reintegrate uh, structures like NATO, like European Union. They have they had to find new modus, new modus vivendi. They have to, to find new. Uh, um, a new style, uh, and of course to improve, uh, uh, because this um, uh, last development they largely revealed some uh, some uh, flaws uh, in in all these uh, institutions. Not to mention United Nations, which are rather rather dead than alive. Um, uh, so there are a lot of work to be done, and uh, Ukraine, in a way, of course, uh, helps to to solve this problem. I believe. Mm, uh, I, I strongly believe that Ukraine would get this uh, process, this chance to become a candidate to, to the EU. Uh, of course, it, I understand we, we all understand this is a long way, but it's, uh, it's a crucial signal, it's a crucial symbolical signal which should be given. I, I believe, even though I understand that you know Ukraine is not prepared for this, it's not ready. It's a huge uh, homework to be done uh, in terms of uh, reforms, in terms of legislation. We, we understand this. Uh, but um, I believe it's kind of, of Western debt to Ukraine because they uh, prioritize Russia for hundred for for three, three for thirty years. Uh, they played this uh, Russia first policy, um, and Ukraine was uh, excluded from all these Euro integration projects, even though it was more or less on the same level as you know Balkan states. Maybe it was not on par with uh, Central Europeans like uh, Poland or. Czechoslovakia, but it was absolutely comparable to uh, to, to, Yugos to former Yugoslavia, to Romania, Bulgaria, but it was excluded be just because of, because of uh, concerns with Russia. We understand this. We, I mentioned uh, already that uh, not a single um, official document of the EU ever mentioned, ever referred to Ukraine as European state. It's, it's remarkable. They were so uh, so afraid uh, to to give incentive to to give some you know, reason for Ukraine to apply that they never referred to Ukraine as European state. It was mentioned already as a partner state or neighbor state, neighboring state, but not European. <laughs> it's uh, only only now, only um, in in March. Um, the European Union recognized that Ukraine belongs to European family. It's the first time when Ukraine was openly referred as belonging to European family. It's, it's bitter irony, yes. I'm happy that, of course, they, they, they said it, but uh, on the other hand, it's very, very sad that they, it took uh, 30 years uh, to, to recognize this, and it took um, a few months of war, of huge losses, uh, to, to, uh, to prove that we are uh, belong to European family. It's really bitter irony. Exactly. Uh, yes, and as a final comment, as, as a relatively recent member of PEN Canada, I can tell you that it is very much on our minds here in Canada to support Ukrainian intellectuals to make sure that they have the complete freedom of expression and that their voices are being heard in the West. So, you know, some people say that Canada is a land where a Ukrainian dream was realized, that, you know, that Ukrainian immigrants coming to Canada became prosperous and educated and supporting democracy and supporting their homeland as well. And we do feel this responsibility uh, to Ukraine very strongly. And at that historical moment, it is actually our responsibility to make the voices of Ukrainian intellectuals heard loudly in the West. So thank you, Mikola. Thank you, Sari. Yeah, thank you both. Thank you, dear gentlemen, for this conversation. And thank you a lot for pointing out one more time the difference between the crisis and the conflict and explaining African and Latin American contexts. Our, you, a lot of our viewers are not really so familiar about that. Because even here in the UK, which is extremely supportive, sometimes we have to fight with, let's call it, wrong wording. And even if, as Mr. McCullough said, this is the only this scale war carried out by a complete totalitarian regime against democracy, even if not perfect one. So the Cold War is not over. And we have one question quite popular among our listeners. 
And I would ask you both to respond your own way. Which level of cancelling on Russian culture do you support? Hmm. Okay. Um, well, I, I, I can answer. I'm not afraid of this question. Um, it's we can't topical. avoid this question, you know. That. <laughs> It's very, very topical. It's uh, broadly discussed. If you if you take a look at Ukrainian uh, Facebook, uh, Ukrainian social media, it's really a very topical issue. Um, uh, Ukrainians, uh, most Ukrainians take very radical stance in this regard. Uh, I largely agree, but uh, I understand that you know we have we have to uh, to maybe not to cancel Russian culture completely, but we have we have of course to postpone it to put it aside. For the time being during the war just because for very simple reasons there is no soft power during the war uh, culture is perceived usually as soft power sport is uh, soft, soft power but you know that authoritarian regimes very often use so-called uh, sport washing and culture washing uh, of, of their own images and during the war it's, it becomes uh, especially uh, important factor uh, because all the soft power transforms and contribute to harsh power, uh, contribute to to, uh, to symbolical strengthening of uh, of the aggressor state. So I believe that for, for, for the time being, we have just to put aside all this, you know, uh, Russian cultural uh, artifacts and and, and, and perfect, uh, wonderful works, either music or whatever, regardless of political views of of, of, of the creators. And for the, for the time being, probably, uh, if possible, to replace it with some Ukrainian works because Ukraine was underrepresented for, for centuries. Ukraine was overshadowed, uh, silenced, or canceled by the empire, actually. So it, it, it should be kind of revenge today. And Ukraine should be promoted now as a victim, as a country which deserves some sympathy and empathy. Uh, so I perceive this mostly as a temporary uh, phenomenon to, to, to postpone, to postpone, to put aside. Uh, Russian culture, but also as a first step to uh, re-examination, re reconsideration of all this uh, huge, huge um, volume of um, cultural artifacts and, of course, biographies. Uh, Russian culture should be, of course, re-examined, re-read, re-read, uh, and re-evaluated. We have to, to uh, put uh, to to uh, to put more clearly that uh, most of uh, creators are Russian imperialists, are chauvinists, very often xenophobes, um, uh, like, like, like Dostoevsky, like Brodsky, and, and so on. So this does not undermine them as a writers. Of course, they are, they are good writers, good, uh, good artists, and so on. But of course, but, but, but a spade should be called a spade. We have to call imperialists imperialists and chauvinists a chauvinists, uh, regardless of their artistic achievements. Mm -hmm. So um, I believe it's a first step toward production of new uh, canon of Russian literature and culture, new hierarchies, uh, and so on. We, uh, there is a huge uh, revisionist work which should be done, uh, which I call, can be broadly called decolonization. Yeah, and I agree with Mikola. And also, um, I'd like to say that there is a very simple test of Russian cultural figures, let's take a look how they express their attitude, what kind of attitude they express to the Russian imperial conquest in the past, in the present. And then that would give us a very clear idea that, you know, Pushkin welcomed the suppression of the Polish rebellion. I'm sorry. <laughs> now, um, of course, there is a Russian culture of uh, Anna Politkovska, the journalist who was murdered because she was covering the aspects of the Putin regime. Um, there is also a statement, I think this week, from the Baryshnikov Center in the United States, decisively condemning the invasion of Ukraine and supporting the Ukrainian fight for independence. So when a Russian cultural figure takes a stance like that, that is a signal that they should be welcome in Ukraine. And of course, there are complex cases. Mikko is completely right. Tolstoy is perhaps the most notorious a complex case because he is against the war. He condemns imperial conquest or any war for that matter, but he is totally colorblind to the multi-ethnic um, nature of the Russian Empire. Like he he visits Kiev, but to him it's well little Russia. Russians live there, so it, he doesn't see it. Um, one of his most famous works, uh, I cannot keep silent, 
was basically a reaction to the news about a group of Ukrainian peasants being hanged in the Kherson, um, uh, in the Kherson region. So it is prompted by an episode in Ukrainian history, but it is again colorblind. He doesn't see them as Ukrainian peasants. He doesn't see the presence of empire in this episode. And so I, I wrote an article about that for local history maybe a month or two ago, and I'm actually working on the ne next one, in which I said, well, there can be a Tolstoy Lane, Provulok, next to Politkovskaya Street but probably not the Tolstoy Square and the Tolstoy uh, subway station right in the center of the capital. By the way, by the way he does not uh, notice only Ukrainians, he also doesn't notice uh, Czechs, uh, because he never never mentions that Auster is somewhere in, in uh, Czechia. Yeah, but he does, he yeah, does notice was... the, the Montaniras of the Caucasus, but the Slavs are all the same Orthodox Slavdom, yeah, exactly. So there's a huge, huge uh, job ahead to revise it. <laughs> That's for sure. A couple of weeks ago, we had a conversation with Volodymyr Shiko, uh, who said, I'm not about cancellation, I'm about fair representation. And as an academic myself, I can add that until Slavic studies or on the world will be represented for 78% by Russian studies, we are not talking about any cancellation at all. It's not only about Czech, it's about great Polish culture, it's about incredible Bosnian, Slovene, and other cultures which are all coming from the very same region. Thank you again for a lot of important and very realistic insights which describe the reality of the position of Ukraine in the world. And this is what our conversations are about, to try to find an answer to the question, what can I do today? And today I should quote Mr. Sergei, wake up, listen to Ukraine, and if you are Ukrainian, speak out. Nothing about Ukraine without Ukrainians. And this is our responsibility to empower the original voices. We are grateful to our partners for their help. The project is implemented with the support of US Embassy in Ukraine and our traditional partners, Pan America, the Ukrainian Institute, the Ukrainian Institute London, Ukraine World, the Harvard University Ukrainian Research Institute, the Harmon Institute at Columbia University, and today also Pan Canada. We were streaming the event to all partner Facebook pages. And gratitude, of course, to Pan Ukraine, which continues to stand at the front lines in the name of freedom and truth. Pan International is proud to support and to be a platform that supports freedom of expression. We hope those dialogues give you enough insights and material for deep thinking. Thank you again, our great speakers. I really enjoyed and that was pure cognitive pleasure. <laughs> I believe that our viewers absolutely share in this position. The next episode will be broadcast on July, July 5, 6 p.m. Cape time, 4 p.m. London time. And our special guests this time are another source, this time literary ones, Orhan Pamuk, bookish novelist, screenwriter, and academic and novelist, and Sofia Andruhavich, outstanding Ukrainian writer and translator. Follow our dialogues of war, spread the war, and stand with Ukraine. This is our shared responsibility today. Thank you. Thank you.